I think uh, we could start. Thank you all for joining today. And uh, this is our session on demand and utilization of health services and also covering demand for health insurance. Thank you for uh, submitting your posters and uh, also like participating in this uh, session. During this COVID uh, pandemic, we are like participating in an online Congress and this wonderful participation from all over the world is a, like, it's a really, really uh, good thing to see that everybody is participating here. I am very happy that so many of us is in this in this session, and we are uh, we are sa like seventeen people. We are like presenting in this session, and I'm going to first introduce uh, like our presenters, and then we will go one by one with uh, each of the poster. Our first uh, presentation will be from India. Uh, Vinapani Rajiv Burma like, uh, is here to present that study. And the following presentation will be from Indonesia, uh, will be from uh, Australia, Rabia Adawi, uh, who, who will focus on a prenatal care service in Indonesia. Vinapani has a second presentation also with, like with her um, study in India. And the fourth presentation will be from Belgium, Luigi Bogion, about uh, uh, healthcare used by native and immigrants uh, um, people in Europe. The next presentation presenter will be Stephanie Ilinek. Ilinka, so uh, apology if I if I pronounced it incorrectly, Stefania Ilinka, who will present on gender differences or, or for home and community based care. The following presentation will be Mr. Yang Zhao, uh, who will present uh, rural urban di uh, differences of cancer care in China. Next presentation presenter will be Michael Borger, who will um, who, who will present the urgency and cost influence of uh, cost sharing uh, in, uh, to for health service consumption. And uh, Michael, I really like the title you, you used, "Devil in the Details." And the following presenter will be Judith Liu from University of Melbourne about uh, elderly patients uh, taking up their men, uh, services for mental disorders. And uh, the following presentation will be, a presenter will be Stefan Rabbe, uh, who will present on geographical variation of uh, medical device use in European countries uh, through a mod model analysis. Then Muriel Levy, from University of Oxford, like uh, uh, he will present on determinants of uh, use of hospital tires uh, for uh, cardiovascular diseases. Then Chen Wan, who is going to present um, like uh, the optimal portfolio choice for for um, uh, retired old old um, uh, population how it affects their choice of health insurance and healthcare utilization. Then Judith Liu again uh, from University of Melbourne. Uh, she will present on private health insurance incentives for uh, elderly patient in Australia. Professor Shafiu Mohammed from Nigeria, he will present on uh, participation, participation of community pharmacies in national health insurance. Then Emmanuel Rukandu uh, from University of Bonn uh, presenting the health insurance premium changes in, uh, in Rwanda. 
And lastly, Christian Leopold uh, from in, um, Germany, who is presenting on health shocks and uh, demand for long-term care insurance. Uh, welcome all to this session. And please let me know if there is any technical issues um, and or you could not hear or see the uh, screen. I, I will try to uh, manage that. And uh, I will start the session with uh, Vinapani. Please uh, make your first presentation on demand and utilization of health services and demand, sorry, uh, on your unraveling barriers and enablers to universal health coverage, operationalizing Tanahashi framework for bottleneck analysis in a district level study. Uh I would like to interrupt over here. I'm dropping the first study. I'm presenting the third one. Okay. Yeah. So the third one will be on inequities in morbidity and healthcare utilization in India. Estimates from various uh, rounds of cross-sectional survey from 2004 to 2017 and 18. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vinavani. Go ahead. Is it legible, the screen? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Veena Pani. I'm a PhD candidate from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, in India. Uh, today, I'm presenting about the inequities in the uh, self-reported morbidity and the uh, non-utilization of the ambulatory care services in India. Uh, so uh, we have estimated the horizontal inequities in uh, both these measures, which is the self-reported morbidity and the untreated morbidity in India, uh, because health outcomes in India are characterized by pervasive inequities uh, in terms of socioeconomic gradients. Uh, but the evidence on the same is not commensurate with this uh, policy objectives. There are not much studies which have been conducted in India, which have unraveled the horizontal inequities per se. Uh, in the health outcome measures, particularly in the self-reported morbidity and the untreated uh, morbidity. So uh, horizontal inequity uh, to say is the equal treatment for the equal need irrespective of um, your place of residence, income, education, social group and all. So uh, these inequities are systematic, avoidable and they are unfair and unjust. So it's very important to uh, unravel uh, the extent of it and magnitude of it in low and middle income countries such as in India. So with that background, we have two objectives. Uh, first one is to uh, assess the magnitude of and the change over the period of time in the horizontal inequities um, in self-reported morbidity and untreated morbidity. So we have conducted this exercise both at the national level and the disaggregated regional level, state level. Uh, secondly, we have decomposed these income-related inequities uh, to uh, unravel the determinants and the contribution of the individual factors which drive these inequities. Uh, the methods which we have used is, yeah. So you have 30, 30 more seconds. Oh my God. So uh, we have uh, used the cross-sectional data uh, from the National Sample Survey Organization, which is uh, a uh, uh, big data uh, and we have measures uh, of the reported morbidity which was indicated or captured by whether an individual is suffering uh, uh, from any ailment in the past 15 days prior to survey and the untreated morbidity is whether any individual has uh, sought the formal care uh, when they were ill. So we have used the erigus concentration indices to compute the horizontal inequity and we have decomposed the same. Um, so the results which we found were, we found like pervasive horizontal inequities in India, uh, both nationally and at the disaggregated regional level. Uh, so uh, the horizontal inequities were more in the highly developed states, but these were the states which were at the advanced level of the epidemiological transition. Uh, these inequities have converged over a period of time. Uh, however, when we speak about the untreated morbidity, uh, they were more pervasive uh, 
for the poor more concentrated towards the poor they were pro poor and they have also converged over a period of time from 2004 to 2017 18 and talking about the relative factors which have driven the inequity in india we found that the non need factors or the socio economic factors they were more uh, important in driving the inequities as compared to the need based factors so to say um, though india has uh, implemented a lot of schemes targeted towards the poor both in terms of the service package and the financial risk protection but they have not converged the inequity gaps over the period of time thank you thank you vinapani uh, thank you so much now i am uh, uh, like i know that uh, we are not going through every bit vinapani if you have any burning issue that you uh, like uh, not able to like present here just uh, let us know in the uh, chat box we will be able to like um, inform uh, discuss on that if required now i am inviting rabia adawia the kirbin institute um, from australia to present on broadening the spotlight on equity measuring differences in access to high quality prenatal care in indonesia rabia yes thank you shamima uh, should i share my screen too or you will yes. no please share your screen okay sure uh i cannot scare i cannot start screen or oh, i think uh, i think fina pani need, need to stop uh, screen sharing uh, first before stop your uh, screen sharing please yeah thank you thank you fina pani uh yes so everyone can see yeah now we can see you could uh, yes. um, like show it in and slide yes i'll just yes uh thank you everyone and thank you shamima for the introduction so our study actually would like to track the progress toward achieving universal access to high quality prenatal care in indonesia after the health reform in 2014 we measure differences in the quality of prenatal care in five different clinical settings and geographical areas and we use data from the indonesian family life survey fifth wave uh we found actually consistent with other reports more than 95% of pregnant women in indonesia attended prenatal care at least once during the pregnancy however we observe inequality across household welfare trials uh in the utilization of full antenatal care visit well which we define as at least having four visit during pregnancy and facility based delivery and this were observed more in the region outer of java bali islands in indonesia quality scores were measured using clinical case scenarios and a knowledge score was generated using providers responses to clinical vignette these figures measure how far the figures uh, the black and white figures actually measure the, how far the average mean score for each provider are from the overall average the raw average of quality score for prenatal care was 42.7% indicating that prenatal care providers only spontaneously mention fewer than half of the practice guideline and may suggest that the relatively low knowledge of evidence based practice uh and from this figure we al also can see that the quality score was lower in outer java bali region and the option of high quality services were limited in the region so this is uh the the black and white there is a wide variation in the quality of prenatal care across clinical setting regions and world quartiles in indonesia with public providers facility tend to deliver higher quality compared to the private our recommendation includes strengthening national health insurance empanelment to the private providers of maternal care who actually provided service uh, provided maternal services to more than 50% of pregnant women in indonesia and reinforcing professional development and supportive supervision for quality care especially in rural and remote areas in indonesia yeah that's all thank you thank you rabia to maintain the time that's wonderful yes. thank you uh, okay now i am inviting uh, vinapani said already presented this one so i'm uh, inviting luigi bogian 
Luigi, could you please uh, present your uh, yes. poster on foregoon care and horizontal equity? Horizontal yes. equity you... in health care use. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all see my screen? Can you hear me well as well? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Luigi Bojan. I'm a PhD student in economics at Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. Um, this is a joint work with my PhD supervisor, Professor Sandy Tuboeuf. And uh, so basically here we are uh, investigating a needs for care in Europe. We are focusing on the, uh, on the European elderly population and we are measuring disparities between immigrants and natives. Um, in order to conduct this analysis, we are using SHARE, that is the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in, of, in Europe, which I believe is also used by some of the other presenters today. Um, so we are, working, we are working on 15 European countries and we restrict analysis on three waves. Um, basically, uh, what we do is uh, we, we look for uh, which dimensions of the immigrant status are associated to the disparities in foregone care or in unmet needs for care. And we also delve into uh, the channels that can help explaining these observed disparities. So our methods, basically, we estimate the probability of renouncing to care. Um, we have a bunch of covariates that, that, that we use, so mainly uh, the immigrant status, uh, which is a, a vector composed of, of, of several dimensions, the fact of being a citizen, a non-citizen, the fact of being uh, of, of, Euro of European origin or non-European origin, uh, being a first or a second generation immigrant. So we have, we have a lot of um, uh, dimensions in our definition of immigrants. And we have the socioeconomic status, the needs, the demographics, and uh, it's quite standard. We have like the country and the way fixed effects. So we compare results from linear probability models and logistic regressions um, to see actually how uh, by uh, playing with these covariates, the effect of the immigrant status variables are uh, changed uh, by uh, across different uh, specifications. So we also look, looked for some channels in the literature that could help explaining these observed disparities. And we ended up with uh, two sets of channels. The first one is more cultural related. So we found some proxies for uh, language barriers, religiosity, or whether like we, we, we have the, uh, the frequency of praying and, and social trust, so the general trust towards the others. Uh, and then the second list of channels includes more related to the micro level decision to renounce to care. And namely, we included um, uh, the, the, the experience of, of, of past health shocks, which is also something that I believe some of, some of the others will talk about later. Um, the uh, attitude to risk, the financial attitude to risk, and also the, um, the, uh, the health insurance coverage schemes. So our results show that there are differences between immigrants and natives. Uh, in particular, both first and second generation immigrants would be 2% more likely than natives to renounce to care. This effect is mainly driven by non by immigrants of non-European origins. And we also find that actually all of the, all of the, the cultural related um, channels actually help partially mitigating disparities, while among the others, only um, the health insurance coverage one can actually uh, contribute to, uh, to absorb a part of the observed disparities. So I thank you for your attention. I might probably uh, type something in the, in the chat if, about um, what I need suggestions on. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for managing time and also uh, presenting in a very, uh, very important topic, like how the immigrants are different from the uh, like um, native population. It's, it's a very, very important perspective of the equity, uh, equity uh, nowadays um, with this global uh, uh, perspective. Now I am inviting um, Stefania Ilinka from uh, European Center for Social Welfare and Policy Research to present on gender differences in use of home and community-based care, a longitudinal analysis of the effects of widowhood and living arrangements. I found this like uh, abstract very uh, interesting. So, uh, Stefania, are you here? I couldn't see her name in the list. <clears throat> so let's move to the next one. Is uh, Mr. Yang Zhao from University of Melbourne, Australia, uh, to present on his uh, poster on socioeconomic and rural and urban differences in healthcare and catastrophic health expenditure among cancer patients in China analysis of 
analysis of the 2011 to 2015 China Health and Retirement Longitudinal Study. Mr. Yang Zhao. I could see you in the list. Could you hear me? Young, uh, could you hear me? Uh, maybe some technical issues are here. Okay, uh, let us uh, move to the next one. Michael Berdiger to present devil in the details, how urgency and cost uh, influence the effect of cost sharing on healthcare services consumption patterns. Michael. Morning. I hope you can hear and see me well. Yeah. Good, and you should now be able to see the poster. Yes, we could see it, thank you. Okay, in all brevity, I'm uh, Michael Berger from the Medical University of Vienna, uh, and this is definitely the details, uh, work in progress that I'm working on with two colleagues, also from Austria. The idea of our paper is that cost sharing schemes are usually a common pillar in the financing of numerous healthcare systems. And in this, they often fulfill a dual role. So they are not just a direct means to generate revenue, but they are also used to steer or influence the patient behavior. And the effects of cost sharing uh, on the demand for healthcare services is um, well documented and extensively discussed, but usually um, researchers tend to have uh, to take a macro perspective. So there's not much literature on um, the demand reactions of very specific healthcare uh, services. So our aim of this paper is to provide an intuitive framework to better understand how changes to a cost sharing regime impact the demand for specific healthcare services. Uh, and we hypothesize that this can be classified uh, along two dimensions. Uh, namely uh, costs and urgency of the healthcare service in question. We use uh, empirical data from Austria um, and that a natural experiment that was possible because one of the sickness funds reduced the coinsurance rate. And we use this to um, two step, for two-step research design. So we use matching via entropy balancing and first step. And then the second one, we use um, a difference in difference estimation. And we do in fact find um, uh, the, the, the results, some in, um, instances for our, um, for our hypothesis. However, there are some limitations that kind of uh, reduce the explanatory power of our um, of our study, mainly that we have a problem with uh, pre-trends. So we look at 11 healthcare services in total, and we can only run our full analysis on two of these services. So I will be, if you're interested, just drop me an email. Uh, my email is down below if you have any further questions, but this is the basic gist of this paper, I think. Thank you, Michael. And uh, now, I will invite Judith, Judith Liu from University of Melbourne to present her work on how do older adults with mental disorders respond to complex cost sharing design. And this is another type of inequity in our society, like, uh, like uh, general healthcare and mental disorders, uh, which always has uh, like different attention and different uh, type of uh, Preference. So over to Judith to present her poster. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well and see the screen? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Judith Liu. I'm a research fellow at the University of Melbourne, and this is the joint work with Yu Ting Zhang, my colleague, and uh, Cameron Kaplan at University of Southern California. And so basically, uh, mental disorders are of major medical and economic significance throughout the US and around the world. So in this paper, we focus on older adults, uh, those who are age 65 and older with mental illness to study how they respond to changes in complex insurance designs using a quasi-experimental design 
that exploits the US Medicare Part D, uh, the prescription drugs um, program. Um, so basically the Part D program uh, start to close the gap. There's a gap uh, within the benefit design uh, gradually closing from 2011 to 2020. So we use that as our natural experiment. Uh, our data is coming from Medicare claims data from 2007 to 2018. Um, and we study two main outcomes. One is utilization and the other one is out-of-pocket spending. Uh, we mainly focus on uh, using a difference in difference approach. And we examine the effects separated for branded and generic drugs to reflect different changes in insurance coverage by drug type. We also compare the results across different types of mental disorders and to the general Medicare population to understand how the policy affects different people um, um, differently. So basically we find that uh, closing the coverage gap substantially reduce individual annual out-of-pocket spending. This is not surprisingly, and it's you know, uh, aligned with our policy expectation. Um, however, we find that the policy increased branded drug use uh, with effects for patients with Alzheimer and dementia being much smaller than the other group. So that's about 3% versus a 20% reduction. Um, so we find that, uh, we also find that the policy decreased generic drug utilization for all groups by two to 4%. So the key um, insight here is we provide evidence that patients' response to price changes vary across different mental disorders and by, by drug type. And our findings imply that lowering medical uh, medication cost has differential impacts across diseases and may not be sufficient to improve adherence for all conditions, especially for those with severe mental health disorders such as Alzheimer and dementia. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would love to have your feedback um, uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That's, uh, that's really interesting finding specifically like cost sharing and uh, out of pocket for they, they have to pay <coughs> at, at their last stage of life that's uh, that's actually very like uh, not very uh, what could I say like uh, what what we are supposed to see uh, I now uh, welcome again Michael you uh, for your second uh, poster the regional medical practice variation in high cost healthcare services evidence from diagnostic imaging in Austria. Austria. Yes, thank you. I hope you can see the poster. So this is uh, yeah. another piece of research um, uh, I was working on. Uh, it's been already published in the European Journal of Health Economics by now. So between submitting the abstract to this conference and uh, presenting it, um, the title is already kind of informative on this one. So what we were looking at is the regional medical practice variation for MRI exams in the outpatient sector in Austria, because uh, firstly, MRI is a rather co a comparatively expensive and resource intensive um, diagnostic tool power it can be powerful but if you if it's used without proper indication it can actually doesn't really bring much benefits for patient can actually also have adverse effects and we knew from previous uh, from previous evidence that mri uh, consumption in austria differs strongly by region and uh, we used routine healthcare data to show this uh, just a figure in the uh, bottom left corner where you can see that MRI consumption at district level uh, varies between uh, 52 per 1,000 inhabitants to 128 per 1,000 inhabitants. So there is severe uh, regional variation here. And we used a nice, as I said, a routine healthcare data set uh, quite extensive from 2015 to 2016. Um, with data on the district level, and we kind of tried to find out what drives these regional differences. And we were looking at supply side factors, we were looking at um, administrative factors, so the, the ability of certain uh, sickness funds to restrict access. And we use a simple statistic um, generalized nonlinear multi root regression lineup, and then we decompose the, um, the statistics results. With, uh, with line-to-axaka decomposition 
and we find that the uh, it's not really the, the difference are not rooted in epidemiology or supply side factors. The what emerges as the strongest predicting factor is the fact that some regional sickness funds can uh, impose restrictions on MRI access. But in the blind dog soccer decomposition, we see that 70% of uh, the regional variation is actually unexplained by uh, the factors that we could use in our uh, re uh, regression setup. Thank you. Uh, Michael, just one thing, like if you could clarify a bit uh, for the audiences. Uh, like what type of uh, pairs autonomy there are like uh, in the different regions that um, that created this uh, inequity like uh, can you just uh, say a little bit about that uh, so do you mean the the ability of the sickness funds to regulate the access in, yeah, in, yeah. Um, this is a very austrian specific uh, type because we have uh, nine federal states and each of those federal states has one sickness fund on its own and uh, most of the patients within a certain uh, federal state are um, insured with one uh, with the regional sickness fund there um, and they can impose restrictions in the sense that if you have a uh, if you go to your physician to your primary care physician and he uh, tells you to go to have an MRI uh, then this um, transfer to the MRI has to be um, accepted by the regional sickness fund. So it goes to the, uh, um, you have just to have to um, submit your uh, transfer and then the, uh, they say, okay, this is fine or this is not fine. And not all of the regional sickness funds do so. So this is kind of in their discretion to decide whether they want to impose this or not. And I think it's for three to four states they don't use it, the other five use it, and we really see a strong variation along these lines. So this is the best predictive factor that came up here. Uh, that means it's a, it's a policy like direction that uh, the federal, uh, like uh, the regional areas could adopt that uh, a flexible policy and uh, like a strict policy. That, yes. That's very good to know. Thank you. Uh, now, thank you, Michael. And now I'm. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Stefan Stefan Rabbe from University of Hamburg uh, to present his uh, poster on geographic variation in the utilization of medical devices in four European countries: a multi-level model analysis. Yes, uh, hello everyone. I hope you can all hear me and already see my screen with the uh, poster. Yes. Yes, it's great. Different. Okay. So, yeah, thanks for joining this uh, session. So, my name is uh, Stefan Rappe and I'm from the Hamburg Center for Health Economics in Germany. Um, so, it's my pleasure to present you this uh, joint work we are currently conducting uh, with colleague, colleagues from the Rotterdam University in the Netherlands and uh, the Bocconi University in Italy. And uh, this work is part of an EU-funded project uh, called COMED. Um, so let me try to zoom in a little bit. Um, oh, this doesn't work as well. Okay. Um, so we want to analyze uh, also a variation or geographic variation in the utilization of treatments uh, for nine different case studies. So you can see here uh, on the right. And um, yeah, we clustered these case studies into different treatment categories, uh, which are uh, effective care treatment, uh, preference sensitive care treatment, uh, and the combination of preference sensitive uh, treatment and supply sensitive uh, treatment. And um, we uh, then analyze these uh, different case studies, which uh, with a rich data set, uh, which uh, include, uh, well, first consist of hospital discharge records as well as different variables on the um, hospital uh, and the NUT3, which is our uh, regional level. And uh, we are using a three-level um, logistic uh, model to analyze the data in Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands. And we furthermore calculate the ICC on a regional and hospital level. Um, looking into the results, so first, um, the results of the ICC uh, suggest that uh, most of the variation in treatment um, can be attributed to the hospital level. You can see this by the uh, difference of the scale here, and uh, only a minor part is uh, attributed to the uh, NUT3 level. And uh, the reg regression results, um, so this very large table are probably uh, hard to read, but uh, we see some, um, so the results are quite diverse across um, the different uh, case studies. 
uh, but we see some clustering um, which um, uh, is as expected to uh, the different treatment categories we use. So our model underlines that uh, when addressing variations in the utilization of healthcare, uh, the hospital level is an important level to look at, and furthermore, um, the, uh, it is important to differentiate between these different treatment categories. So, thank you very much uh, for um, listening, and um, well, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them also via mail. So, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. That's uh, really interesting. And uh, I am requesting the, like all participants, uh, whenever you have any questions, either you note it uh, down or better if you please type it down in the chat box, that will be easier for us to respond at the end of the presentations. Uh, thank you. Now I am uh, inviting Muriel Live from University of Oxford to present her postponed determinants of use of hospital tires for major cardiovascular diseases in China between 2009 and 2017. Uh, okay, hi. Muriel, can, you. Yeah. Yeah. can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Now, did it work? No, it's still... No? Oh, okay. Let me try again. Yeah, yeah. should work now. Okay. okay, great. Uh, so yeah, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Muriel, a PhD student in population health, and I'm going to present some work in progress um, as part of my thesis. So a bit of background. So as part of the healthcare reforms in China, uh, differential cost sharing and health insurance schemes were implemented to reduce overcrowding of bigger hospitals and encourage the use of smaller or lower tier hospitals. And so in the study, we examined the effect of health insurance and patient characteristics on the choice of hospital tier for stroke and ischemic heart disease in China between 2009 and 2017. And so we used data from a prospective study of half a million adults in five urban and five rural areas in China. And so we had data on hospital admissions that were obtained from um, electronic linkage to the health insurance records. And so the hospitals in our data are classified in three tiers. So tier one, the smallest, tier two, the medium sized ones, and tier three, the largest hospitals. So for the methods, we used um, McFadden's choice models or conditional logic models uh, separately in urban and rural areas. And for the health insurance characteristic data, we had reimbursement rate, deductibles, and ceiling. And for the patient characteristics, we looked at demographic, socioeconomic, lifestyle, and morbidity factors. Um, and so some of the main findings were that the, the health insurance characteristics influence the choice of hospital tier differently in urban and rural areas in China. And we found that urban residents were more sensitive to changes in, in cost sharing. And while urban residents had a strong preference for the bigger hospitals, the tier three, the use of different hospital tiers was more evenly distributed um, in rural areas. And we saw that in both areas, higher socioeconomic groups and patients with more severe disease types were more likely to choose higher than lower tier hospitals. And also when we tried to simulate some, some policy changes in health insurance characteristics, we found that increasing the deductible in the tier three hospitals, the bigger ones, had the largest effect to guide patients from bigger to smaller hospitals. Um, and so finally, there's still, um, yeah, further initiatives are still needed to harmonize the health insurance benefits across the schemes in China and to decrease inequalities in access to different hospital tiers um, and encourage the use of lower tier hospitals, which remain still low, especially um, in urban areas. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you, sorry. Thank you, Muriel. Sorry, I was talking with my, my microphone mute. It's an interesting perspective that uh, the insurance is affecting the uh, healthcare uh, where they are uh, seeking care uh, in rural and urban areas. Now I am uh, inviting Judith again from University of Melbourne 
to present her uh, poster on effects of private health insurance incentives on the take up among the elderly in Australia. Judy. Hi, so thank you. So I'm presenting another paper. So this is pretty much a work in progress. Um, so any comments will be very helpful. Um, so in this paper, we are uh, looking to Australian context and we study the impact of financial incentives to uh, purchase private health insurance for the elderly. And basically, uh, like many other countries, the Australian healthcare system consists of the universal public insurance and parallel with private health insurance. And the main benefit of having private health insurance is more timely access to elective hospital treatment. And so the policy uh, that we look into is a premium subsidy for the elderly through refundable tax offsets. Uh, from April 2005, the private health insurance rebates increased from 30% to 35% for people aged 65 and 69 years old, and to 40% for those aged 70 years and above. And this provides a natural experiment for us to study how older populations respond to higher private health insurance rebates. Uh, we use data from the Australian tax return data from 2000 to 2012, but we focus more narrowly around the year of 2005, where the policy was enacted. Uh, we use event study design and see whether private health insurance take up uh, changes uh, around that time. And our strategy is to compare uh, private health insurance coverage for the young elderly, so those 65 to 74 who were affected by the policy, relatively to those uh, the near near elderly, those aged 60 to 64, before and after the introduction of higher rebates in 2005. So our preliminary finding uh, is that after the implementation implementation of higher rebates, the take up rate uh, increased modestly for people aged 65 to 69. However, there is no such effect for people aged 70 and above. Um, and we also find that women are more responsive to the rebate increase than men, and the effects are larger in urban area compared to uh, rural area, which might have less uh, access to private hospitals. Um, we also done a lot of uh, robustness stress, but this is still you know, pre very preliminary, so any comments are very helpful. So thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you, Judith. That's a really like um, good perspective to know about older people. Mm, now I am inviting Professor Safiu Mohammed from Nigeria to present on assessment of participation of community pharmacies in National Health Insurance Scheme of Nigeria. Professor Safiu Mohammed. I saw him in the list. Okay, now he is not here. Okay, let's move to the next one. Emmanuel Rukundo, University of Bonn to present an effect of health insurance premium changes on labor market outcomes, evidence from Rwanda. Emmanuel? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, one moment, I'm sharing my screen. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for, for this uh, moment to share my research. So in this paper, we are looking at the uh, effect of health insurance premium changes in a way that uh, uh, what happens when premiums increase for people within a space, within, within a similar socioeconomic categories and compare them with people whom premiums do not increase because they are not enrolled. And uh, this is uh, a unique uh, policy uh, change in Rwanda that happened in 2011, and we use three rounds of cross-section and national countrywide data and apply matching and difference in difference and on the uh, right-hand side, uh, the results are very small, but you can see possibly the table. 
we find that uh, once premiums increase, people tend to reduce working hours uh, in, in different dimensions. So people do not necessarily reduce total work, total work time. This is measured in the number of hours worked in the previous week, but they tend to reduce wage employment hours and also tend to reduce non-agricultural non hours and instead shift a lot of this time to agricultural work activities. And uh, we see this is uh, just being driven by one uh, a targeting method. So the, the method the targeting the, the, the government is using target individuals uh, for this premium increase uh, induces people to, uh, to, to, to try and uh, manipulate their social economic position to, to gain the, to gain the waiver or uh, avoid the premium increase. And uh, we see that uh, the policy implications of this change has actually trickled in in 2020 last year when the government has changed this policy uh, to uh, try and change how the targeting is, made, is done. So this is some formative work in understanding the change, premium changes in health insurance in, in low income countries. And uh, we hope to get some comments from you and uh, uh, both here and on email. So if you have uh, any, we're happy to uh, hear those ones. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. I think you're mute again, Shamima, you're mute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for your presentation. I'm now inviting uh, Christina Leopold for, to present her poster on health shocks and demand for long-term care insurance. Christina? Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay can you see my screen? Yes. So, hello, my name is Christina Leopold from the University of Augsburg in Germany, and I will give you a short overview of my research project, Health Shocks and Demand for Long-Term Care Insurance. Long-term care is one of the largest uninsured financial risks that faces the elderly population in Western countries. Public long-term care insurance offers only partial coverage, and um, private long-term care insurance could fill this gap. A missing experience, but the demand for private long-term care insurance is surprisingly low. Missing experience with long-term care um, was found to be an important factor for the low demand for private long-term care insurance. And I want to extend this research by analyzing how first-hand experience with long-term care impacts the demand for private long-term care insurance. I expect that first-hand experience with long-term care is a much stronger trigger for private long-term care insurance purchase than observed long-term care need. However, the depiction of first-hand experience as exogenous variation with observational data is not easy because individuals who are a nursing case usually lose the possibility to purchase private long-term care insurance. So they are excluded from the market. Therefore, I use a health shock of the partner in the same household as proxy for experience with long-term care. I suppose that the partner is close enough to represent first-hand experience. I use four waves and 11 countries from the survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe. The dependent variable is um, the ownership of a private long-term care insurance contract. The important explaining variable is the health shock of the partner. I measure a partner's health shock as a loss of grip strength of 25% or more from the pre-period to the next period. I use fixed effects estimations and add several control variables. I cannot find a significant effect between a partner's health shock and the ownership of private long-term care insurance. I conduct several robustness checks, but they all confirm this result. A reason might be that I have too little within variation in the data or that I can only approximate first-hand experience with long-term care. Well, I'm looking forward to discuss this with you later and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christine. Uh, uh, for this nice presentation. Uh, before going to discussion, I'm, I just want to check that uh, the presentations we missed by Professor Shafiu Mohammed.
Mr. Yang Zhao and Stephania Linka. Uh, any of them are present now or any of their representative, like uh, any colleague or anybody who could uh, present their poster in on behalf of them? Okay, if, if anybody is not here, we have another poster left uh, by Cheng Wan, but he is, uh, has a parallel session, so he will let us know when he is available. Let us start our uh, discussion section. One of the biggest common thing among all these posters is uh, different types of inequity we are facing uh in in different countries from different perspectives and from different reasons that uh, like why those in, uh, inequities are there and from uh, from developing country to developed country like all the countries range of countries have different types of inequity in healthcare uh, utilization and healthcare access healthcare uh, payment from all perspective there were like a lot different types of um, inequity up there uh, from like a very old theme of uh, poor and rich inequity to the very like uh, quite new uh, the like inequity among the uh, adults and older older people and also like a very new emerging theme of uh, uh, inequity be between using the like uh, di diagnostic tools versus the treatment plans, other treatment plans, inequity between immigrants and native population, in, in, uh, inequity between uh, different reasons of within a country, even um, uh, like within the developed country, there are like re regional inequity. So there are lots of kind of inequity we could, we could see. And that's one of the thing that um, when we are talking about universal health coverage, that's the main issue of um, sustainable development goal, these inequities need to be reduced in, from all perspective. And today we are presenting like different perspectives of inequity, uh, like from uh, Binapani, from India is presenting like uh, the study who, 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 like uh, where she has done the work in a remote where from zone like the zone was like very conflict prone and like where is going on and also like very hard to reach is like over the mountains and like between the mountains those reasons are, are like there so they have ex like accessibility issue they have like a uh, provider like to be there those issues the health system issues and also they have like income issues, like poor and rich issues. <clears throat> to the like older, older people, like with mental health, how they are like uh, seeking care, like what are the like factors impacting their seeking care? Like with the patient, I cannot imagine like with the patient with Alzheimer's and dementia in their 65s or 70s, they're they are, like ha having to have pay for most of their medications. Like the insurance companies are not covering their medication cost. So that's very difficult at this at that age to pay everyday medication. And uh, uh, to, uh, to the European countries where immigrants are using the healthcare like quite less because of like, uh, they are not having the insurance coverage uh, to the like, um, the uh, countries where there is like MRI facilities are there. However, due to different policy directions of each uh, region, there, there is like uh, problems in uh, or equity in uh, using those MRI or uh, uh, those facilities. And uh, like, and another one is like from China, they are like developing their, like uh, uh, refining their health policies. And within those health for policies, there is like differences in urban and rural areas policies, the schemes are different. So this varieties type of inequity we are talking in this session, I am now like, uh, would like to have like listen a little more from 
few participants, if um, you all of you allow me, uh, <clears throat> those are like really interesting. One is from Luigi from Bel Belgium, that uh, this is a new perspective of like inequity that we are talking about in developed country that uh, uh, immigrants and, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, native Europeans, so what, what is their differences? And uh, also would like to hear from the elderly care in Australia. These two uh, participants, if, if you share a little bit more about the inequity that you addressed and how to, how we, can, we could like think about bringing out a solution for overcoming this inequity. Uh, <clears throat> Luigi, are you there? Yes. Hey, I'm here. I am. Yeah. So, well, thanks for, for the interest in my paper. Um, um, so actually, yes, it is, I mean, it is not really a new perspective what we're using, we're using, and I mean, we are adjusting, we are adjusting um, uh, our differentials for the needs. So this is something that is well established in the literature in public health and health economics. I mean, this is something that has been developed in the last 20 years at least. So it's not really a new perspective in terms of, methodolo in terms of methodology, um, but it is, I think it's interesting to, um, to stress the, that the fact, yeah, maybe it's interesting the outcome it, itself, because we, uh, we are focusing on unmet needs for care, which is, okay, there is a literature on, on unmet needs for care, but most of, but, but most of the time um, research in, uh, in health in, 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 in inequalities in healthcare focus more on specific kinds of, um, of, 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 other, of other healthcare outcomes, namely either the access, so for instance, the, the fact of seeing a doctor, seeing a dentist, uh, having had uh, some kind of visit, or the, the, the count, so the number of visits, the number of hospitalizations. So basically you are measuring the, uh, the healthcare outcome depending on, on the actual use. In our case, we are not measuring this, we are measuring the lack in, um, in I mean, the dissatisfaction of the health needs. So it is the individual that tells you if, um, like, if their needs are, have not been satisfied, uh, satisfied um, as, they, as, they, as they should have been. And so I, I, I believe, and also with my, with my co-author, and like, we believe that this is kind of very important to, um, I mean, it is a very important outcome to, to stress and to explore. We are measuring something else, of course, but it is kind of very interesting, so thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Luigi. And I think like another perspective would be very interesting if, if um, uh, we, could, we could learn a little bit more is um, like uh, how the cultural background of those immigrants affect their healthcare use. Because where they are coming from, that, that might affect their, their uh, like uh, healthcare use and insurance system, all those things. And also the like, um, uh, also the flexibility flexibility of the health policy to enter in, in into the, into the new country. Th those those uh, would be like um, important also to like uh, explore how they affect. Uh, thank you, Luigi. Thank you so much. And I now want to uh, invite Rabia to like um, to share a little bit more about the quality of care, quality score. Like uh, I, I uh, like uh, went through your abstract and I found an interesting thing that uh, uh, the quality score for uh, private and uh, public providers are different. Uh, the public providers is scoring much better than, than the private providers. However, the like uh, service use, even the quality is poor, is uh, like uh, almost the same. So uh, I just would like to know, like e even when the quality is poor, what is leading this uh, omen to use that care? Uh, yeah, so actually, of course, um, maternal mortality in Indonesia is still a stubborn problem, I think. Up until now, we are still in the rate of 177, much more above than 43, uh, which is the, the target of the maternal mortality. So we 
I mean, I and many people in many researchers in Indonesia would like to figure out what happened in terms of access, as we can see as well in this, in this, in this, uh, in the findings that we found that the utilization of prenatal care is quite high among 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 pregnant women. So one of the questions, of course, after we figure out about the access, is about the the quality of the services that maternal uh, that maternal services uh, deliver. We actually uh, try to utilize what is available in the in the Indonesian Family Life Survey, a household based survey. Where they have a, a vignette where they're actually asking a clinical case scenarios to the providers, and they will ask um, um, many questions. But we took 19 questions, which is a practice standard international guideline for the uh, prenatal care. And from the 19 question, we're trying to uh, put a score of that. And then, as 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 our study find that actually, even though of course there is a variations, but in average it's still less 42.7, which means that less than 50% actually of the overall providers of maternal care in Indonesia can spontaneously uh, answering these questions means that we assume that there must be a, a, a low uh, knowledge of the standard guideline of the maternal care services. So, so this is what, what, we, what we found from the study, yeah. Thank you, Rabea. This this actually like reflects a uh, important thing in in uh, almost all develop, developing countries that um, we are increasing the coverage somehow, but those are not like quality services. The services are not still like uh, up to the mark uh, to meet the, uh, like uh, avoid the mortality and morbidity. That's that's a like very uh, important thing. We are reducing the we are increasing the percentage. But that actually like not not bringing in the impact, and because because of the quality of care is not there. Uh, now I am like inviting um, our participants to think a little bit, like uh, how you are you are thinking about the uh, possible solution or possible ways to you know, to. Uh, solve the, the diversity or inequity that you are addressing and how could that uh, like we could bring those solutions in a common way to reduce the uh, like types of inequity and uh, uh, like extent of inequity in our healthcare system uh, what could be a common thing we could we could think of and we could uh, uh, bring on in the in the like uh, uh, in front of researchers into in front of uh, um, our research community community to think about to uh, solve or not solve to address the inequity issues uh, in healthcare. So uh, it's open for all. Like please participate. Uh, what like share your thoughts? Like how you are thinking to solve those issues or to address those, those issues. So if uh, I, could, I could like give you some um, points here. Uh, all the countries have uh, some inequity in among the patients to in, in uh, go for care, care or utilizing the care. How could we address that? And uh, the other perspective of inequity is um, health system, like whether every area or every region have the same kind of uh, health system access uh, to, to, to be e uh, equitable. And the other thing is like whether all the population like children, pregnant women, adults, and elderly population could, uh, could access the uh, healthcare, re required healthcare in, in an equitable way. So these are, these are some kind of varieties of inequity we are talking about today. So what could be the next step? What could be the next thing we could think of to address these uh, this, um, issues? 
Uh, maybe I just add a bit, uh, Shamima. I think uh, yep. one of my, my concerns is actually, especially when measuring inequality, is how we differentiate between um, uh, differences and then an inequality where rooted in injustice. So sometimes it's maybe a simple differences where we are not, where uh, when we not being careful uh, to actually uh, judge something as inequality when it's actually a simple differences between between groups and between that actually quite naturals happen or organically happen and not be, because of a structural injustice. So so that's something that I find very difficult when we are doing inequality study just to make a differences between what is injustice and what is actually organically happen and actually not need to be addressed. Yes. If I, if I can add, if, if I can add, actually, I really agree with this point. This is what I'm doing in this paper. I am, I am creating, like starting at assessing disparities. And many things can be like lying behind this disparity. It could be culture, preferences. So that's why I try to play a little bit the channels. But still, yeah, we need more, more. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, the, 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 always the same issue. We need better data to have more uh, variables to actually <laughs> be actually able to disentangle different things. Um, I mean, at least in... Uh, in, in this in, in in my field but um i mean if i can also add i mean i think that like today in, in health inequality it's interesting of course to measure inequalities and inequities also probably even more interesting than inequalities so using a somehow a normal framework um i mean a normative framework sorry uh, but i think it's also interesting to 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 to, to do more research about like how to reduce these inequalities like we, what, what is actually working so also in line with what yesterday we heard in the mean in the keynote lecture um by, by uh, Marcella Alsan. I mean, she was really saying this. She was really like saying that we need, okay, it's interesting to measure things to disparities, but it, it's also nice to know how to reduce them. So um, I think this is really the where we should, or I mean, at some point, research should also go more. Thank you, Luji. That's a really interesting perspective. And uh, I was thinking in the, in the same way that. Uh, like apart from like uh, health economics, when we, when we talk about health economics, uh, the first impression we have that is uh, quantitative and measuring things. However, to understand the like uh, these things better, we might need to think about our uh, like research design and research methodology that how could we understand the de uh, like deeper perspectives, like this inequity. What is the underlying factors behind this like inequities and uh, like in addition to the measurements, the percentages, what is the reason behind? So um, could, we, could we like include those um, <clears throat> explorative or like qualitative case study type of methodologies along with our, like, when we are planning and designing these studies? So that will give us like more uh, like a strong perspective of what we are uh, trying to address and uh, what are the, <clears throat> what are the like, uh, uh, what could be the possible ways? Because the people who are suffering from the, these things, they are the one who will, who will be able to like uh, bring out some solutions, how they, they will like, will come, confront and uh, use the things. So that's uh, that's that's the way I think like uh, we, we need to think of and uh, we need to include in our studies more that um, like uh, use some component like keep some component of explorative qualitative or case studies or uh, like in-depth interviews um, to understand the in-depth perspectives and then like figure out possible solutions and uh, this this only can, like should not be with the like the people who are facing the inequity also we could use the policymakers and stake, stakeholders and gatekeepers their perspective how they want to like solve these issues that's also could be very important to bring out like actually address this this uh, inequity issues overall <clears throat> so we have only 3 minutes left any other new perspective to add on, like uh, for or to uh, how could we think of like uh, for, uh, like these uh, situations to 
to progress our research work or to advance our research work to the next step. Um, I was wondering, I see Cheng Wang is in the, is in the house now, whether we could uh, uh, get his presentation was quite interesting uh, from the okay. Thank you, Amino. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Cheng, you are here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, would, we would be really like uh, interested to uh, like see your pre uh, poster if you kindly present it for us. Yeah, uh, can you see the uh, uh, poster right now? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think see. Is it in the full screen? Please close your Zoom screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's in full screen. Okay, okay. So thanks for everyone uh, waiting for me. So this is a study about the optimal portfolio choice with longevity and health insurance in a developing country context. So the background of study is actually the, um, motivated by the rapid population aging and also the risk of uh, COVID-19. And in developing countries, you know, there's a very basic public health insurance and that can often lead to catastrophic medical expenditures. So our question is that what is the optimal portfolio for retirees in a less well-developed payment system, uh, for example, urban China. So as a theoretical study, so we are considering using a life cycle modeling and with multiple health states and random health costs. So the, the core thing is that we consider a portfolio with annuity. So this is like the commercial pension. So it will be a regular income as long as you are alive. And then the critical illness insurance, CII, that will give you a large amount of money to help you to, uh, to, do, to, to get the medical uh, services and then not on care insurance. And then a savings. So this is a one-off portfolio choice at retirement. And then for the choice of medical expenditures, uh, we, are, we allow three of them and that will determine the post illness mortality. And we consider different ways on the marginal utility of consumption at a different health states. So that means that if you are poor, the same amount of money you spend probably is different from uh, what you spend when you are healthy. So that's the main thing to capture it. Uh, so this is the individual uh, decision uh, economic model, and this is how we price that. So here I just come to the results of the optimal uh, allocation. So what we find is that uh, if you want to um, use adequate uh, medical expenditures, what we find is that if you have a high wealth or average pension, you have a very high demand for the critical illness insurance. So that will give you a safer thing so you have more consumption. That is kind of you are insured. And then you find the high demand for annuity. And this is kind of reasonable if your pension is low. So the pension, commercial pension is really important uh, as the uh, the existing literature tells us. And what we found is kind of uh, a little puzzling is that there's more demand for long-term care insurance. You know, in developed countries and post developing countries, um, if they are facing the population aging issue, they are trying to do something for that. But, the care, uh, but at the moment, this study shows that the demand for long-term care insurance is kind of low. So that's actually, we think, is kind of uh, being pushed out by the demand for CII for, for the catastrophic medical expenditures. So you have to survive to a high age in order to, to get the long-term care services. Before that, if you are died, so that doesn't really matter. And if you, uh, uh, and here, so this is related to the uh, equity equity uh, discussion we, ju we, just, um, we just mentioned. So we find that there's a substantial welfare gain uh, with the optimal insurance and this is especially for those with less wealth or pension. So uh, if you are wealthier, you have an optimal portfolio and uh, the increase is this for your welfare. But if you are in, in a lower uh, socioeconomic health status and then you get um, um, optimal insurance, you, you can see the welfare is kind of jumped. So in the welfare sense, this is kind of decreased economic uh, inequality there. So you, you can say that uh, a good insurance can help to reduce the inequality among different people with different uh, uh, economic status. Um, so this is a sensitivity result. We, we don't talk about it. So that the, the key finding is that um, well, 
we use we consider a portfolio with annuity, critical illness insurance, and non-care insurance. And then we consider all the things that kind of relate you to the health uh, risks and health costs. And our findings that the, the demand for critical illness is very high, but depends on the choice of metric expenditure and high demand for annuity if pension is low. And there is more demand for long-term care insurance. Um, that's all. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. That's a very uh, interesting piece of work. Uh, like we are uh, uh, three minutes over uh, from our yeah. due time. Uh, do you have like any of you had any specific questions for Jim? Yeah, if you have any interest, then you can just uh, send the questions to, to my email. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> it's over time. I understand. Yeah. 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 Uh, so. Like as, as the time is over, I, I would like to thank you all for, uh, for your presentations. And um, thank, it, these are like very interesting piece of work. And uh, uh, I, I hope that we will continue our efforts in, the, in, in uh, on, uh, like assessing our, measuring our health service utilization and where, where are the pockets there, uh, where we could improve uh, our health, health, health ser service delivery and uh, um, healthcare utilization in every country from like low income country to developed country. In every country, there would be like a small pockets where there is scope to improve. Like the, the, where there is like, a, we could, we could uh, push a little bit to improve our overall health status, overall health, health outcomes. So um, I, I, I would like to have like that uh, we will, Put our efforts and our works, continue our works to like identify those pockets and or, like uh, uh, think about like some solutions to explore, like understand uh, more in depth of those reasons how why these inequities and uh, differences are happening, and also like what could be the possible way to address those inequities and uh, uh, so solve those and. Uh, because if we only show the problem that that will not guide our policymakers or stakeholders how to address that so we also our like uh, uh, researchers also need to come up with some some possible points some possible ways where uh, how we could like um, like uh, what could be the next step uh, like for the stakeholders to discuss to, for those uh, like uh, issues to address those issues and uh, in every country we have different type of like inequity status in health healthcare. So we will continue our work on the, ad, for addressing those issues. And with that hope, I, I would like to conclude this session with the message we are taking that we researchers will um, include our like um, use like a, uh, different methodologies to understand these things and also bring out some, some possible ways to make this world a little better and a little more like uh, equitable, equitable. So with that hope, I would like to thank you all and uh, for your nice work, please continue your work and we will communicate in other forums in other like places. Thank you everyone.